Forward of Hector Berlioz, a romantic tragedy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Hector Berlioz, a romantic tragedy by Herbert Francis Pizer. Forward. A thumbnail sketch like the present is of course the last place in the world to recount even an infinitesimal part of a life so vivid and crowded with bitter conflict and tragic experience as that of hector berlioz and the person who attempts it is beaten in advance moreover such an effort seems almost gratuitous for berlioz has told his own story better than any one else could possibly do it when ernest newman was asked at one time to write a new biography of the epoch-making composer he informed the publisher who suggested it that no life by any other hands will ever be able to bear comparison as a piece of literature with berlioz's autobiography all others are for the most part a watering down into the author's inferior style of the sparkling prose of berlioz himself how much more futile is it to attempt on the minuscule scale of the following tiny if rambling pamphlet to touch upon even a thousandth of those achievements and unremitting conflicts which entered into the texture of this master's agitated and inharmonious life actually it aims to do no more than contribute a mite toward a larger interest in the writings and the great mass of insufficiently discovered compositions of a romanticist whose labors are still surprisingly unrecognized artworks of the future h f p end of forward Part One of Hector Berlioz, A Romantic Tragedy, by Herbert Francis Pizer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. No doubt I deserve to go to hell, said Berlioz once to a friend who had reproached him for his treatment of Henrietta Smithson, his first wife. But what would you have? I am in hell already. It was not an exaggeration or a figure of speech berlioz was in hell the greater part of his life of all the great composers he was perhaps the most consistently wretched misery and frustration pursued him from his youth to his grave time and again his existence seemed like the fulfilment of a curse actually his mother had called one down upon him at the very beginning of his career and for the rest of his days it appeared to work itself out implacably one might even believe the malediction had retained its power beyond the tomb for the posthumous glory of berlioz is by no means unchallenged almost alone among the masters he does not command anything like universal admiration let alone affection he has his redoubtable champions and they include many of the greatest musicians living and dead but where bach mozart beethoven chopin schubert brahms wagner need no defence berlioz incontestably does rightly or wrongly he continues to be a problem with all that this condition implies yet without him music could not conceivably be just what it is and perhaps the strangest aspect of the paradox is that only a limited portion of his output enjoys anything like what might be called frequent hearing the greater part of his greatest works remains to all intents undiscovered nay unsuspected by the multitude the little mountain town la cote st andre where louis hector berlioz was born on december eleventh eighteen o three had briefly been called la cote bonne eau during the revolution and the reign of terror when saints for a while went out of fashion it was not far from grenoble on one side or from lyon on another the berlioz family originated in savoy and can be traced back to the sixteenth century hector's father louis berlioz a doctor and a property owner had at one time been mayor of la cote saint andre in eighteen o two he had married marie antoinette josephine marmion a good-looking woman religious to the point of bigotry hector was the oldest of six children two of whom died at an early age 
the surviving daughters nancy and adele were followed as late as eighteen twenty by a son prosper a problem child in the truest sense of the term vague and unmanageable up to the time of a belated adolescence then developing into a mathematical genius and dying in his twentieth year before people had ceased to marvel at his talents hector's father supervised his early education though it was probably as a concession to his wife that he placed the youngster in the local catholic seminary the boy did not stay there long even if his mother harbored ambitions of making a saint of him for a time he went uncomplainingly to mass communion confession and the rest in his memoirs hector tells us details of his weekly confessions when he would say to the director of his conscience my father i have done nothing and that worthy would reply go on my child as you have begun and so he did for several years at least yet his mother's religiosity was to have the effect of turning hector's thought away from the church and toward the great figures of classical mythology he felt his heart throb and his voice quiver and break when he construed the fourth book of Virgil's Aeneid to his father, and when the good man tactfully cut the lesson short, Hector was intensely grateful to him for taking no notice of my emotion and rushed away to vent my Virgilian grief in solitude. Mythology was not the only love with which his father filled him. Under the paternal guidance, he developed an interest in geography, and stories of travel helped fire his imagination. From an early age, Hector had shown a sensitiveness to musical impressions, and besides learning to sing at sight, acquired some proficiency in playing the flute and the flageolet, though I was twelve before the magic of music was revealed to me presently he added to his musical accomplishments the playing of the guitar the piano he never apparently undertook to master but in later years he made a virtue of necessity and insisted he was glad to compose silently and freely without having to depend on the keyboard with harmony it was rather different, and after an unsuccessful start with Rameau's treatise on the subject, even in a simplified form, he had recourse to a textbook by Cattell in order to pick up some elementary principles. These he presently put to use in a six-part potpourri on a collection of Italian airs and in the composition of a couple of quintets for flute and strings the first was played by some local amateurs and aroused the enthusiasm of all the hearers except hector's father dr berlioz preferred as much of the later quintet as his son was able to play him on the flute but the piece being much more difficult the amateur executants who tried it quickly suffered shipwreck the composer eventually burned both scores yet salvaged a theme his father had liked and then used it in his overture les france juges simultaneously with these hit or miss musical studies the boy's emotional life was heightened at about this time by an incipient love affair if one can call it so hector's relatives the marmions had a country house near grenoble in the village of milan where he spent his vacations not far away in a white cottage surrounded by vineyards and gardens there lived with her mother and sister a tall and exceedingly pretty girl of eighteen estelle duboeuf at a family garden party to which hector and his relations had been invited estelle picked him for her partner in some game poor hector was conquered in the twinkling of an eye when a few minutes later he caught sight of Estelle dancing with his uncle Marmion, who had been a soldier in Napoleon's armies and cut a superb figure in his gaudy uniform and clanking spurs, the boy flew into a jealous rage, only to have the whole party laugh at him. But Estelle, his Stella Montis, his Star of the Mountain, remained enshrined in his memory for life their ways were to separate and they lost track of each other for years a haggard old man racked and buffeted by numerous woes and disappointments he found her again and sought solace vainly as it proved in an attempt to recapture the shadow of a childhood fancy his reward was a polite note signed estelle fournier her married name and a conventional affectionate greetings into which he chose to read meanings that the old lady never remotely intended 
Hector's parents determined he should follow in his father's footsteps and become a physician. The idea revolted him, and he struggled against it, much as Schumann combated his mother's wish to make a jurist of a youth with the soul of a poet. Nevertheless, he made as if to comply with the parental will, though one can guess with how many unspoken reservations. And so, in the autumn of 1821, he set off for Paris to study medicine. But what fascinated him there were the theatres, the opera houses, the concert halls, things which up to that time he had never enjoyed the opportunity of visiting and not the loathsome hospitals, anatomical amphitheatres, dissecting rooms, and other nauseating horrors. He had felt all along that he was never intended to spend his life at the bedside of sick people in hospitals and dissecting chambers. His father had made the cardinal mistake of using his love of music as a lever for removing his childish aversion to embark on the study of medicine, and as a reward for working earnestly at osteology, had given his refractory son nothing less to the purpose than a splendid flute with all the new keys. In Paris, Hector lost no time visiting the Opera, the Théâtre Italien, the Théâtre Fédio, the Ambigu Comique. He heard Salieri's Danaides, Bourdieu's Voitures Versailles, Delarec's Nina. Above all, he heard Gluck's Iphigenie en Paride, and this masterpiece definitely settled the question. His life would be dedicated to music, and medicine could go hang. Berlioz, the scarlet romanticist, was born at the moment he solemnly made this resolve. It was farewell henceforth to the human charnel-house, littered with fragments of limbs, ghastly faces, and cloven heads, where swarms of sparrows fought for scraps, and rats in the corners gnawed human vertebrae. He had, to be sure, grown somewhat hardened after his first appalling impression, and had even gotten so far as to cast a shoulder-blade to a great rat which was staring at me with famished eyes. But the physical reactions he experienced to the music he loved attracted him in the same degree as the horrid displays of the hospital laboratories revolted him. In the theatre, listening to Gluck and Spontini, his knees would tremble convulsively, his teeth would chatter, he suffered with dizzy spells till he could not stand unsupported, he was bathed in sweat, his scalp contracted, tears choked him, he lost all sensation in fingers and toes, he was seized with chills and hot flashes. If this was not actually a type of celestial intoxication, it was probably a romantic imagination conveyed through the empurpled diction of the hour. Down at his home in the Dauphiné, Dr. Berlioz gradually got wind of what was happening and endeavored to reason with his son. The latter was frequenting the library of the Conservatoire, voraciously devouring the scores of Gluck and leaving to those who had a taste for that sort of thing the sanguinary details of the anatomical chamber. And not only did he study the music of Gluck, Melieu, and others, but he addressed himself to the first two symphonies of Beethoven, at that time as good as unknown in Paris. In the conservatoire library he met a certain Hyacinth Christophe Eronimo, a pupil of Lesure, who counseled Hector to study with his affable old master, at one time a great favorite. Le Sueur received Hector amiably at the first visit, examined a few compositions of the young man, pronounced them faulty, but urged him to undertake some preparatory studies under Gerano, a task he willingly accepted. In a short time Gerano indoctrinated him so thoroughly in Lesueur's harmonic system that the latter cordially took him as a pupil. Not that Hector accepted his mentor's teaching without many unspoken questions, but he quickly decided that the most diplomatic thing to do was to curb whatever impatience he felt and listen in silence. He had already written a choral work, Le Passage de la Mer Rouge, and a Mass, and though they were youthful attempts and obviously unripe, he found it possible to dispense with conventional rules, and now he felt moved to attempt an opera. 
the obliging gerano supplied him with a libretto and the fruit of this collaboration was called estelle et nemorin estelle de boeuf doubtless floating before his mind's eye berlioz admits that the music was feeble and called the entire work wishy-washy as for the mass composed by request for the feast day of the choir children of the church of st roch portions of it met the approval of le Sur. when it came to paying the cost of its performance hector was in a quandary about raising the necessary twelve hundred francs finally he borrowed the sum from a friend augustin de pont a step he was presently to regret though pons had lent him the money with the best of intentions the mass itself was praised and some years later was repeated at the church of st eustache by this time however the composer had become dissatisfied with the work and then burned it together with several juvenile effusions meanwhile he had a stormy first meeting with cherubini head of the conservatoire and he failed to pass a preliminary examination for that august school hearing of this misfortune dr berlioz usually slow to wrath lost his temper and resolved to stop his son's allowance if anything le Sur aggravated the situation by attempting to intercede on his pupil's behalf hector was summoned home and ordered to renounce his ideas of a musical career and take up some other occupation in spite of the chilling reception the young black sheep encountered there he was astonished and delighted to learn a few days later that the good doctor had once more reconsidered after several sleepless nights i have made up my mind he gravely told his son you shall go to paris and study music but only for a time if after further trials you fail you will i am sure acknowledge that i have done what was right and you will choose some other career you know what i think of second-rate poets second-rate artists are no better and it would be a deep sorrow and profound humiliation to me to see you numbered among these useless members of society and he swore the youth to secrecy but the news leaked out and before hector could take his place in the stage-coach his mother blazing with anger confronted him with flashing eyes and exciting gestures your father she exclaimed has been weak enough to allow you to return to paris and to encourage your mad wicked plans but i will not have this guilt on my soul and once and for all i forbid your departure i beseech you not to persist in your folly see i your mother kneel to you and beg you humbly to renounce it and when the appalled hector begged her to rise she defied him wildly no i will kneel so wretched boy you refuse you can stand unmoved with your mother kneeling at your feet well then go go and wallow in the filth of paris sully your name and kill your father and me with sorrow and shame i will not re-enter this house till you have left it you are my son no longer i curse you hector had to leave as he says without bidding her good-bye without another word or a look and with her curse on my head back in paris his first object was to repay pons part of the money he owed him for the performance of the st roch mass he earned a few francs by giving occasional lessons in singing and by teaching flute and guitar his monthly allowance amounted only to a hundred and twenty francs so the repayment was a slow and painful business most unhappily pons wishing to spare hector this continuous drain on his purse resolved to uh, help his friend by writing dr berlioz and asking him to settle the remainder of the debt pons got his money but poor hector lost his allowance somehow he managed to scrape along he had a tiny room five flights up in the cité at the corner of the quai des orfèvres and the rue de arlay he gave up dining in restaurants and confined his diet to dry bread and salt with now and then raisins or dates when the weather was favourable he took his meal on the pont neuf beside the statue of henri cat watching the passers-by or gazing at the muddy waters of the seine he worked tirelessly at his music 
cherubini now apparently mollified put the youth into reicha's class for counterpoint and fugue at the conservatoire even while he continued with lesur hector struck up a lifelong friendship with young umbert ferrand who wrote him an opera book les francs jews the judges of the secret court which he enthusiastically set to music but of which only the overture remains it is a fine thing of its type bearing melodically instrumentally and harmonically the unmistakable imprint of berlioz even to the reminders of gluck one of its most striking themes survives from the boyish quintet of hector's and anticipates in a fashion the idee fixe of the symphonie fantastique not very far ahead working on his opera young berlioz had somewhat neglected his flute and guitar pupils and once more needed money even a frank a lesson would not help greatly when it became a question of winter clothes and firewood far from capitulating and returning beaten to dauphine he first toyed with the idea of seeking a position as first or second flute in some orchestra in new york mexico sydney or calcutta of becoming a sailor filibuster buccaneer or savage in china or attempting any other wild scheme since it is futile and dangerous to thwart my will when i am resolved on anything in the end he tried a safer less exciting method aided by a streak of luck and an exceptionally good musical memory he obtained an engagement as a chorus singer at the theatre des nouveautés where basses were wanted but where a passable baritone could also be of use by singing as a trial piece a recitative from sacchini's oedipe he prevailed over a weaver a blacksmith an actor and a choir member from saint eustache the job paid him fifty francs a month hector had not only to sing all manner of rubbish but the colossal manager a mr saint leger sometimes obliged him to be the rear leg of an artificial camel even so it was luck of a sort at the same time two new pupils applied for lessons and he met antoine chabanel a young man from la Côte saint andre whose father had often scandalized madame berlioz because being a tireless woman chaser he flew in the face of her family's ancient motto respectability above everything chabanel a budding pharmacist found it advisable to share economics with hector and the pair set up bachelor quarters in two little rooms in the rue de la harpe chabanel cooked and hector marketed grossly violating the hygienic codes of his friend by carrying the day's provisions unwrapped under his arm hector calls the franc juge overture his first grand instrumental work it was soon followed by another overture waverley he was he tells us so ignorant of the mechanism of certain instruments at that period that he had written the trombone solo in the earlier score in the key of d flat uncertain whether this choice of tonality was a wise one or not on submitting the passage to a trombone player at the opera he was delighted to learn that it was the best possible key for the purpose and that the solo in question could not fail to produce a powerful effect greatly elated he walked home as in a dream and was recalled to himself by suddenly spraining his ankle from that moment he could never hear the piece without experiencing a sharp pain in his foot perhaps he muses in his memoirs it gives others a pain in their heads curiously enough neither reicha nor lesur taught him anything about instrumentation thanks to a friend at the opera he obtained free tickets and by close listening at such performances and study of such scores as were given he perceived the subtle connection between musical expression and the special art of instrumentation which no one had actually pointed out to me it was by studying the method of beethoven weber and spontini by an impartial examination of the regular forms of instrumentation and of unusual forms and combinations partly by listening to artists and getting them to make experiments for me on their instruments and partly by instinct that i acquired what knowledge i possess and was later to disseminate in his great treatise on instrumentation subsequently modernized by richard strauss 
hector was officially admitted to the conservatoire when the next examination period having come round he succeeded at last in passing the test he was less fortunate with an orchestral scena on the death of orpheus which the students were required to compose though berlioz ascribed his failure to the incompetence of a mediocre pianist obliged to play the reduction of the original score he had obtained a brief leave from his duties at the théâtre des nouveautés when he came down with a dangerous attack of quinsy sore throat alone one night and on the point of strangling he suddenly sat down before his shaving mirror seized a penknife and in a paroxysm of agony lanced the obstruction which was suffocating him by some miracle he was on his feet again in a few days and had the satisfaction of hearing from his suddenly repentant father that his allowance was to be restored having no further need of continuing his chorister chores he was now free to devote his evenings to opera performances these evenings he declares were solemn occasions they could be tumultuous ones as well for hector was violent when matters outraged him and as often as not became an irrepressible claqueur more than once he had helped precipitate riots in the theatre when at a performance of iphigenie on tauride for instance cymbals were introduced into a ballet passage where gluck had only strings and when trombones were omitted from a passage in orestes third act recitative hector could suddenly shout with all his might there are no cymbals there and who has dared to correct gluck then in an orestes passage not a sign of a trombone it is intolerable again during a performance of dalirac's nina berlioz missed a violin solo scheduled to be played by the violinist Ballot. just as the cue for the expected solo was reached a furious voice was heard to exclaim so far so good but where is the violin solo very true cried someone else it looks as if they were going to leave it out Bayo, Bayo, the violin solo the pit took fire the entire house rose and loudly demanded that the program should be carried out according to schedule before long people dashed into the orchestra overturning chairs and music desks smashing the kettle drums meanwhile hector who had sown the wind tried to control the whirlwind with sarcastic protests gentlemen don't smash the instruments what vandalism don't you see you are destroying father chenie's beautiful double bass with its infernal tone but the mob was beyond control and broke not only instruments but innumerable seats and music stands as well it was eighteen twenty seven and he was beginning to harbor more far-darting ambitions in june he planned to try for the prix de rome though he really laid small value on the honor the winning of it conferred how often was it no more than a means to an end three times berlioz competed for if we count the preliminary test of eighteen twenty six in which he failed but not until eighteen thirty did he carry off the honor in eighteen twenty seven he had written for the purpose l'amour d'orfei in eighteen twenty eight he gained the second prize in eighteen twenty nine when no prize was finally given he turned out a cleopatra which had it been less audacious might have won him the award while in eighteen thirty his cantata sardinapole finally achieved the ultimate distinction but this honor so highly regarded among the rank and file of frenchmen was for hector soon to turn to something like dead sea fruit on september eleventh eighteen twenty seven kemble's company from london inaugurated a shakespearean season at the odeon theatre hamlet was the first offering with the famous english actor in the title role the ophelia was henrietta smithson tall lithe and irish all literary and artistic paris was on hand from the moment the daughter of polonius stepped on the stage hector was lost no thunderbolt could more completely have devastated him when the performance ended he rushed home avoiding all acquaintances to whom he might have had to talk then he went out again and walked all night along the seine determined to wear himself out to obtain the temporary solace of sleep it was useless 
next evening the visitors were giving romeo and juliet hector dashed to the odeon early in the day and bought himself a ticket to be sure no unforeseen hitch might prevent him obtaining his usual admission as he knew no word of english he procured a translation and strove for a few hours to recreate in his mind a picture of henrietta smithson before again looking upon her in the flesh if possible the effect of the previous evening was intensified he would now wander aimlessly through suburbs and countryside sometimes even sleeping in open fields or he would set to music irish lyrics by thomas moore or steep himself in more shakespeare dabble in byron and walter scott set about discovering goethe and acquainting himself with faust he moved from the quarters of his friend chabanel and installed himself in a room in the rue richelieu directly opposite the house where henrietta lived he had never so much as exchanged a word with the actress who for her part never yet dreamed that such a person as hector berlioz existed let alone that he loved her wildly none the less hector made a point of avoiding further shakespeare performances or so at least he claims in his memoirs more experience of the kind would have killed me but the inspiration of this juliet and ophelia further enhanced by the romantic literature with which he was suffusing himself and the grandeur of those beethoven works he was beginning to discover were stimulating his creative fancy he wrote overtures based on waverley king lear the corsair he wrote in eighteen twenty nine eight scenes from faust and a ballade of the king of tuli in gothic style things which were later to form the basis of la damnation de faust he composed a set of nine irish songs above all he wrote and then revised a work which was to become in some respects his most widely known and famous the symphonie fantastique a kind of symphonic phantasmagoria with henrietta as its chief motivation and himself as its chief actor it was not till december eighteen twenty seven that the actress first had a fleeting glimpse of her worshipper this happened quite by chance at a rehearsal for a benefit performance at the opera comique where hector was to offer an overture of his and where some of the english actors were to perform a couple of shakespearean scenes by this time he had begun to write her letters to which she never replied for they frightened her and she presently ordered her maid not to accept any more from the postman when berlioz at a rehearsal caught sight of henrietta talking to her colleagues backstage he muttered a loud cry and rushed from the theatre wildly wringing his hands thinking she had to do with a madman the actress begged her associates to watch him closely for she did not like the look of his eyes the mop of red hair that surmounted his head like an umbrella his gaunt visage fiery appearance and generally hysterical demeanour must have given her reason for alarm and she probably breathed more freely when she left paris for holland end of part one part two of hector berlioz a romantic tragedy by herbert francis peaser this librivox recording is in the public domain every one who has interested himself even slightly in berlioz is doubtless familiar with the lurid fiction the composer invented to form the plot of the fantastic symphony in this episode in the life of an artist a high-strung youth is represented as seeking release from the torments of disappointed love by means of an overdose of opium instead of killing him the drug afflicts him with a succession of perturbing not to say terrifying grotesque or macabre visions through each of them there moves the image of the beloved musically represented by a recurrent string of notes a sort of representative theme or idee fixe the youth is a plaything of passions reveries jealousies frenzies at the outset then he sees his idol apparently indifferent to him the central figure at a brilliant ball 
amorous thoughts mingle in his mind with dark presentiments as he wanders over the countryside rendered more melancholy by the pipings on rustic instruments of two lovesick shepherds till thunderclaps interrupt their mournful dialogue then he dreams he has murdered his beloved and is marched to the scaffold after which his disembodied spirit becomes the sport of a noisome rout of demons witches succubi and other infernal things among whom the cherished one now a devilish harridan pursues him while the dies irae sounds blasphemously in his ears doubtless much of the astounding score incorporates musical ideas originally conceived for other projected works one way or another the fantastique is a formidable if over-dimensioned monument of its period and a landmark of history with all its flamboyant and parodistic monstrosities this fresco of psychopathic experience remains the first great and influential specimen of programme music created in france and it is no less amazing to reflect that the epical score came into being when its composer was but twenty-seven and only at the time he was adjudged worthy of the prix de rome berlioz subsequently sent tickets for a performance of the symphony to henrietta smithson she appears to have been about the only person in the hall unaware at that time that she was the heroine of the piece more or less vaguely she had been hearing of the infatuation of her harassed admirer her reaction lightly expressed had been there could be nothing more impossible it was not in hector's nature to accept such a rejection as final still she had unwittingly wounded him for a while he decided that with all her beauty and her gifts she was no different from the average run of females if she could think of repudiating his love the fantastique was his derisive answer this musical caricature of the actress he intended as a gesture of vengeance the new symphony however helped gain him a friend and defender who was to remain one of his most valiant supporters for life franz liszt liszt had met hector shortly before and transported by the symphony he made a piano arrangement of it which propagandized the work as at the time nothing else could have done scarcely liberated as he thought from henrietta berlioz succumbed to another woman this young person decidedly no better than she should have been was a friend of ferdinand hiller and a piano pupil of kalkbrenner and hertz camille moak set her nets for hector and captured him without the slightest trouble she came into his life at the worst possible moment with the consent of her mother briefly blinded by the young man's success in winning the roman prize camille became engaged to her admirer who was just about to set out for that sojourn in rome which was the chief reward of a lucky contestant he seems not to have foreseen trouble though his sister nancy was beset by premonitions and ferdinand hiller sent to berlioz in rome the ironic message that his betrothed was bearing the separation with fortitude shocked but still only half convinced hector took to bed and waited vainly for camille's expected letters to italy time passed and nothing came whatever interest he might have found in the eternal city where he had been warmly received by his fellow students at the via medici and by its director horace vernet he was unable to pay any attention to his work or his agreeable surroundings little really mattered neither the monuments of rome the french academy his meeting with the well-graced youth felix mendelssohn his future prospects vernet noticing hector's worry began to entertain serious misgivings summoning the newcomer he warned him against any rash step finally on good friday the tormented lover impulsively left rome resolved to return to paris and find out for himself what lay behind camille's silence in roundabout ways he got as far as nice on the journey he bought a pistol and some poison determined to learn the truth and if worst came to worst to shoot camille and then make an end of himself he was not obliged to go to these spectacular extremes for at long last he received a letter not indeed from his presumable fiancée but from her mother 
that lady informed hector that her daughter was on the point of marrying mr pleyel the famous piano manufacturer and she requested her son-in-law not to kill himself of course he would kill himself and the mokes as well but as he looked at the lovely cote d'azur landscape unrolled before him from the heights of the grand corniche he suddenly experienced a revulsion of feeling for the time being he would go on living he dispatched a letter to horace vernet saying he was returning to rome and pledging his honour to remain in italy then he settled down for three weeks in nice and wrote his king lear overture hector became more or less resigned to rome now that the moke affair was definitely at an end but was never completely at home there he enjoyed the company of mendelssohn for the two were well matched intellectually if not well balanced by temperament however felix adored gluck as much as hector and the two youths delighted in singing and playing armide together they agreed wholeheartedly in their worship of mozart beethoven and weber but disagreed on bach whom the german idolized but to whom berlioz remained cold when the pair went over hector's prize-crowned sardanapale and the frenchman frankly expressed his dislike for a certain number in it mendelssohn told his friend he was happy to see that he really displayed such good taste hector made the usual excursions saw the regulation sights visited the mountains of the abruzzi wandered about the campagna renewed his virgilian recollections sang strummed his guitar heard the operas and the generally trivial and ill-performed church music and mingled with the painters at the cafe greco in short he went more or less through the customary tourist routine also he composed he made changes in the score of the fantastique adding for one thing a coda to the ball scene he wrote overtures to the corsair based on byron and rob roy based on scott not to mention an ambitious pendant to the fantastique le retour à la vie to which he subsequently gave the alternative title of le Lille but by eighteen thirty two he decided he had endured as much of rome as he could stomach after a compromise with horace vernet he cut short his stay at the villa medici by six months promising to spend a year in germany an ambition he had always cherished in november eighteen thirty two berlioz was back in paris and in that very house where henrietta smithson had lodged on her first visit in fact she had moved out only a day earlier and settled in an apartment on the rue de rivoli small wonder that hector discerned the working of destiny once more this time henrietta had come to paris with her own theatrical company incredible as it may seem she and hector had not yet actually met the irish actress divined his passion fully when at a performance under the conductor habeneck at which not only the fantastique but also the monodrama le lio were performed she heard from the actor who spoke the text the words ah could i but find this as juliet this ophelia whom my heart is ever seeking could i but sleep my last sad sleep in her beloved arms instead of going to germany at new year's eighteen thirty three berlioz determined to remain for the moment in paris his love for henrietta had been newly awakened and she was now willing to be formally introduced to him from that day i had not a moment's rest terrible fears were succeeded by delirious hopes what i went through cannot be described her mother and sister formerly opposed our union my own parents would not hear of it discontent and anger on the part of both families and all the scenes to which such opposition gives birth in these cases portents of trouble followed thick and fast henrietta smithson's theatrical venture failed disastrously financially she was utterly ruined the more so as she had contracted immense debts next she fell and broke her leg she was bedridden and she remained an invalid hector organized a benefit concert for her among the first to offer their services were liszt and chopin enough was realized to settle harriet's most pressing obligations and then despite his parents objections and the venomous hostility of henrietta's hunchbacked sister hector married her in the autumn of eighteen thirty three 
first however staging a spectacular suicide act to frighten her into wedlock she was he assured his friend umbert ferrand aussi vierge qu'il soit possible de l'être to keep the domestic pot boiling he found it advisable about this period to take up musical journalism although berlioz had been contributing on and off to certain publications his present connection with l'europe littéraire is to all intents the official beginning of that critical activity of his which was to span almost the remainder of his life a subsequent music reviewer on the influential journal des debats he spent no end of time and effort in commenting on compositions and performances good bad and indifferent which he might infinitely better have dedicated to creative work the labor revolted him but he found himself as helpless as a galley slave in forced attendance at innumerable concerts and operas he came to loathe to such an extent that late in his career when he was finally able to shake off the journalistic fetters he enjoyed walking up and down in front of a theatre or concert hall just for the pleasure of reflecting that he did not have to go in and yet of all celebrated composers berlioz was by all odds the most brilliantly gifted litterateur whose writings even to-day preserve most of their individuality polished style barbed irony and scintillant humor aside from his countless feuilletons and other articles his memoirs soirees de l'orchestra a travers champ and much else are literary masterpieces of their kind which even to-day retain their freshness and sparkle undoubtedly his important journalistic affiliations had the effect of involving him in numberless intrigues and difficulties inseparable from posts of influence besides sapping his energies that should have been employed otherwise yet he knew how to draw profit from the means of publicity and power which his connections placed in his hands and he did not hesitate to promote as best possible his personal interests when their marriage was solemnized at the british embassy with liszt as best man hector had exactly two hundred francs and harriet a mountain of debts for their honeymoon they could travel no further than the suburb of vincennes the wedding trip according to the groom was a masterpiece of love all the same he soon had chances to notice that his bride was not in the least musical likewise that she harbored a streak of jealousy not even the birth of their son louis on august fifteenth eighteen thirty four at their home on the hill of montmartre helped soothe this unhappy state of affairs which was to deepen as time went on harriet grew violently opposed to her husband's travelling though berlioz claims that a mad and for some time an absolutely groundless jealousy was at the bottom of it was it absolutely groundless the composer's intimate associate ernest legové has let us into many secrets about the rift in the lute in his book soixante ans de souvenir the blonde irishwoman some years older than her husband was gradually losing her looks her failures as an actress had for some time increasingly embittered her and she presently took to drink the more the sentiments of the formerly so ardent hector changed to a correct and calm good fellowship says le Gouvet, the more his wife became imperious in her exigencies and indulged in violent recriminations that were unfortunately justified berlioz whose position as critic and as composer producing his own works made the theatre his real world found there occasions for lapses that would have proved too much for stronger heads than his moreover his reputation as a misunderstood great artist endowed him with a halo that easily tempted his female interpreters to become his consolers madame berlioz searched his feuilletons for hints of his infidelities and not only there fragments of intercepted letters drawers indiscreetly opened brought her revelations just sufficient to make her beside herself without more than half illuminating her her jealousy was always outdistanced by the facts berlioz's heart went so fast that she could not keep pace with it when after so much research she lighted upon some object of his passion that particular passion was no more 
and then it being easy for him to prove his innocence at the moment the poor woman was as abashed as a dog which after having followed a track for half an hour arrives at the lair only to find the quarry already gone yet the jealous instincts of the once lovely ophelia and juliet were in fact only too sound and if her shrewishness increased by leaps and bounds she had no little cause for it hector's friends seemed perhaps a little less devoted to him since his marriage and since his miseries were a trifle less spectacular than they had been during his bachelor days but these comrades included not a few personages illustrious in their respective spheres among them were the musical chroniclers janine and uh, dortigue the essayist and novelist le gouvet eugene sue alexander dumas saint beve victor hugo among the creative and performing musicians liszt of course and chopin who though personally the antithesis of berlioz never wavered in his faithfulness to the man and further flashing like a comet across the firmament of hector there was the demon fiddler paganini in eighteen thirty four berlioz composed the descriptive symphony harold in italy in which byron's child harold the central figure of the work was represented by a viola solo whether hector's account of the genesis of the composition is wholly authentic or not the tale he relates in his memoirs runs somewhat as follows having heard the symphonie fantastique one day paganini came to see the composer and told him that he owned a wonderful Stradivari viola which he would love to play in public, though he had no music for it which he considered suitable. Would Hector write him such a work? He had no confidence in anyone else. The only thing the violinist insisted upon was that he must be playing the whole time. The work should not be an ordinary concerto, but rather something along the lines of the fantastique after much doubts and hesitations the composer produced a series of scenes for orchestra the pictorial background of which was shaped out of hector's recollections of his italian wanderings while the viola strain representing byron's dreamer was added to the rest of the orchestral texture with which it contrasts both in movement and character without hindering the development paganini did not hear the symphony till some time after it had been first performed for he had been south vainly seeking relief from that cancer of the larynx which had robbed him of his voice and was shortly to prove fatal at the close of the work he ordered his son to tell the composer he had never in his life been so impressed at a concert and were he to follow his inclination he would go down on his knees to thank him and then, in full view of the audience, the great violinist did just that, and kissed Hector's hand. Next day he received a letter in Paganini's writing which ran, Beethoven is dead, and Berlioz alone can revive him. I have heard your divine compositions, so worthy of your genius, and beg you to accept, in token of my homage, twenty thousand francs. Almost on the heels of this windfall, Berlioz had the additional luck of being commissioned by the government to compose a requiem for an official ceremony. The work is one of his most monumental, one might say apocalyptic, even if the quality of its musical inspiration may be open to question. One thing, however, is certain, nothing he ever wrote is so overwhelming in point of sheer sonority as the appalling tuba mirum, with its five orchestras, its sixteen kettle drums, and its phalanxes of trombones. At the climax of this fresco of the Last Judgment, one of the participating singers succumbed in public to a shrieking frenzy of nervous prostration there was talk in governmental circles of purchasing the requiem of a grand decoration of a professorship at the conservatoire of a generous pension from the beaux-arts ministry nothing came of all these plans as far as the conservatoire post was concerned berlioz was rejected as teacher of harmony at that institution on the ground that he could not play piano which was as true as it was irrelevant but a far greater and more fateful disappointment lay ahead. Early in 1838 his mother, who had cursed him, died at La Côte-Saint-André. 
her curse did not perish with her in fact it smote him soon afterward when his lyric drama benvenuto cellini failed grievously at the opera where after long and torturing efforts he at length managed to have it performed not even today can it be said to have gained anything like a permanent foothold on the stage as time went on actor tried to master his inhospitable fate in the operatic theatre by various compromises and subterfuges he sought to create a dramatic symphony based on romeo and juliet and neither outright drama nor outright symphony which accounts for its infrequent performance despite the extraordinary beauty of some of its music he wrote a concert opera which is in effect a cantata masquerading as an opera and vice versa la damnation de faust one of the three most essential capturings in music of goethe's faust drama was at its first hearing in eighteen forty six possibly the most distressful defeats he ever suffered at the hands of his countrymen not until decades after his death did he enjoy a kind of posthumous revenge when raoul gunzburg in monte carlo fashioned a stage production which is now one of the mainstays of the paris opera a destiny in some respects even more deplorable was that of his music drama les troyennes which he was never to hear in its completeness the one theatre work of berlioz to enjoy something like an uncontested triumph at its launching was his two-act opera comique beatrice et benedict for which shakespeare provided the original incentive as for romeo et juliet its high points are found in two movements the rapturous love scene which includes the most enamouring melodic lines berlioz ever conceived and the unparagoned queen mab scherzo embodying the composer's instrumental fantasy at its most subtle and ravishing even if parisian criticism of the time could see no more in it than a little noise like that of an ill-greased syringe that long scheduled visit to germany continued to be deferred meantime berlioz had been appointed assistant librarian at the paris conservatoire a small distinction to be sure but offering at any rate a few additional francs a more ponderable achievement was the composition for band of a three movement symphonie funebre at triomphal planned for performance in the open air in memory of those fallen at the revolution of eighteen thirty the funeral and triumphal symphony was one of the first compositions of berlioz which wagner heard when he arrived in paris in eighteen forty wagner was struck by the nobility of the work ranked it among the loftiest achievements of its composer and retained an undissembled admiration for it all his days berlioz had reason to believe that after this official labor he might be called to step into the shoes of cherubini at the conservatoire when that worthy went to his reward in eighteen forty two but the choice fell upon georges onslow and hector realizing that if he was ever to obtain in paris the distinction to which he felt himself entitled he would have to enhance his french reputation by properly publicized successes abroad so he began by giving several concerts in brussels the second of which was destined to be important less so for musical reasons than because of domestic entanglements it initiated knowing harriet's jealousy hector seems to have been strangely incautious about keeping secret the identity of his uh, travelling companion it did not take his alternately maudlin and assiduous irish wife many days to find out from the papers that a certain marie riccio was the snake in the grass the riccio was a second-rate singer whose real name was marie genevieve martin hector had met her in eighteen forty one we are told that she rekindled in his heart those romantic emotions the now slatternly and alcoholic harriet could no longer feed marie's mother encouraged the liaison because she realized the power berlioz had come to be in the journalistic field he had been so imprudent as to impose her on one operatic management and the game had turned out badly before long poor hector found himself as luckless in his second love affair as he had been in his first End of part two.